My name's Tom, welcome back to my channel, which is the first in a series of slightly more freeform video essays that I'm planning on putting together over the coming months. Some of which are going to pick apart some popular cultural texts through various theoretical frameworks, and some which are going to be slightly more earnest reflections on some elements of our culture that pique my interest for one reason or another. Today, we're taking a look at episode one of the new series of Black Mirror, Striking Vipers. In particular, we're going to draw on some ideas from queer theory to ask how Striking Vipers engages with and critiques dominant ideas surrounding sexuality and gender. Before we get going, if you have any thoughts as we go along, then please don't hesitate to pop those down below. And if you're new around here and this seems like your kind of thing, then please do consider subscribing. Finally, a big thank you today to Ash for recently signing up to the top tier of my Patreon. If you would like to support what I do, get your hands on scripts of the videos that I make, as well as maybe get yourself a little shout out too, then please do check out my Patreon page linked below. With that out of the way, however, let's take a look at how Black Mirror Striking Vipers in engages with gender, masculinity, and sexuality. Black Mirror is often billed as a show about technology. In 2015, Daniel Mallory Ortberg semi-famously joked that one could sum up the central premise of the series with the question, what if phones but too much? Yet, in truth, the various technological innovations the show presents us with are little more than scene dressing, narrative devices which enable the show to explore much deeper truths about the human experience which existed far prior to the invention of the microchip and will persist through countless other innovations. The technology which drives the plot of Striking Vipers, for instance, is essentially a projection of what virtual reality technology might look like in a few decades' time. And the small, glowing discs which form the hardware portion of that technology have appeared twice before in the series. Once fixed to the temples of the elderly Kelly and Yorkie in San Junipero, and once on that of Robert Daly in USS Callister. Yet, when we really think about it, San Junipero is not really all that interested in potential technological innovations in palliative care. Instead, it seeks to raise much more human questions about our anxieties, hopes and fears surrounding death and dying. And similarly, to read the USS Callister solely as a story about video games would be to ignore the much deeper themes of power dynamics, agency and control which run throughout that episode. In Striking Vipers, this future VR technology is once again deployed for gaming purposes. It allows old college friends Danny and Carl to immerse themselves in the world of their favourite fighting game, Striking Vipers. Whilst their real-world bodies lie back in a near-paralytic state, save for the odd twitch, cerebrally they embody their chosen fighters in a world which is not only visually realistic, but physically so too. Games such as Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter, which serve as the inspiration for Striking Vipers, the game, tend to frame physical violence as somewhat trivial. Here, however, being punched in the face is no laughing matter, and as Danny and Carl soon find out, the developer's emulation of physical sensation is not confined to pain, but also extends to pleasure. For in only their second round of combat, Carl, in the virtual body of Roxette, pins Danny, playing as Lance, to the ground, and in the heat of the moment, they find themselves unclenching their fists and instead kissing. In the following weeks, what initially seemed to be a spur-of-the-moment impulse turns out to have been an eruption of something much deeper. Despite some initial uncertainty, Carl and Danny find themselves returning to Striking Vipers, and their relationship, not only sexual but emotional and romantic, begins to blossom. Thus, where Striking Vipers, the game, like its real-world corollary, seems to have been built for an assumed male player base to indulge in aggressive, hyper-masculine fantasy, it ends up providing a virtual arena in which Danny and Carl can explore their sexuality. Much like San Junipero, USS Callister, or any other episode of Black Mirror then, Striking Vipers is about far more than just speculating about what technological advances might come about in the next few decades. Certainly, it is the VR technology which puts the episode's plot into motion, but the thematic focus is one which is both all too human and which has considerable ramifications for the present. For if we were to try to reduce this episode down to its thematic core, 
It would not be about gaming at all, but instead our perceptions of gender, masculinity and sexuality, and how we navigate these fields in constructing our identities. As does all good drama, Striking Vipers places Danny and Khan in a complex web of intersecting conflicts. The most obvious of these is perhaps the danger that their relationship poses for Danny's marriage. We see him torn throughout between honouring his commitment to his wife, Theo, and reneging on all that to further explore his changing relationship with Carl. In all the analyses of the episode that I've seen on this website, it's that theme of infidelity which has invited the most comments. However, to my mind, this is somewhat secondary. I would posit that the conflict which guides the episode most significantly is, in fact, psychological, and arises not from what others might think of Danny, Carl and their new relationship, but the manner in which this new discovery throws all that they thought they knew about their own gender and sexual identities into question. Now, given that I'm not going to talk any great length about Carl's repeated choice to enter the virtual world of Striking Vipers as Roxette, it may seem strange that I've chosen to talk about gender here. For in an ideal world, gender identity and sexual identity would be two entirely separate phenomena. Whether one considers themselves to be a man, woman, non-binary or none of the above should have little relevance to which gender one finds sexually attractive or is prone to falling in love with. In practice, however, this is not the case. In her 1995 book Masculinities, R.W. Connell sets out to explore the dynamics of masculinity in contemporary society. While recognising that masculinity is in fact incredibly diverse and expressed in very different ways by different people, she coins the term hegemonic masculinity to refer to the dominant and necessarily simplistic idea of what practices or activities are considered to be, for want of a better word, manly at any given point in time. Not all men will exhibit all the traits that are considered as such, but her argument is that anyone who considers themselves to be a man will construct their gender identity in dialogue with that prevailing stereotype. In Striking Vipers, for instance, there are numerous ways in which Danny and Carl don't conform with our simplistic, stereotypical idea of what it is to be a man. Yet, they certainly display some level of investment in being perceived by others and, as importantly, conceiving of themselves as masculine. They play violent, narrative-light video games. They drink beer. Carl is constantly boasting of his sexual conquests and if there's a barbecue to be lit then Danny will be first in line. Their allegiance to this normative mode of masculinity is in fact reflected in the aesthetic of the episode. Both Danny and Theo's clothing and the mise-en-scene of their suburban environment draws heavy inspiration from the 1950s. Stephanie Kuntz has argued that, though the era was, in truth, one in which notions of masculinity were incredibly turbulent, the 1950s is often drawn upon as a point of reference for so-called traditional family structure and gender roles. Cultural representations of this period often present us with an image of men as breadwinners who return home from work and eat a meal prepared by their wives alongside their 2.4 children before retiring to the office to read the paper. From the perspective of the present, we rightly view such gender dynamics as highly restrictive. This was evidently the case for women in this era whose agency was severely curtailed by such norms. But without detracting from that, we can also recognise that it was often limiting for men too. We need only to look at the plays of Arthur Miller set in the period to see the psychological impact of the expectations of emotional fortitude and sort of unfeelingness placed upon men. Societal ideas around what it is to be a man have clearly changed in many ways in the intervening decades, yet by invoking the aesthetic of the 1950s, Striking Viper seeks to foreground how restricting gender norms, however they might manifest, can be. Nevertheless, our complex relationship with gender means that, even if we recognise the manner in which masculinity or femininity constrain us, our investment in being a man or woman often provokes us to leap to its defence. There's a clear moment of this in Striking Vipers when Carl lets slip to Danny that he's recently taking to waxing his pubic hair. 
This is certainly not an act which tends to fall within the terms of hegemonic masculinity. And Danny's first response is to recoil from this revelation with amazement. Then both characters try to laugh it off. Finally, with some bravado, they both try to suggest that it is in fact a masculine thing to do because Carl is doing it to impress women. This not only further shows how invested Danny and Carl are in being perceived by others and conceiving of themselves within the terms of hegemonic masculinity, it also reveals how tied their conception of masculinity is to heterosexuality. For just as when it comes down to it, gender as a social and psychological identity has little to do with physiology, so too are social perceptions of sexuality about far more than who one chooses to sleep with. And, argues R.W. Connell, gayness in patriarchal ideology is the repository of whatever is symbolically expelled from hegemonic masculinity. Hegemonic masculinity thus encourages us to consider masculinity as one and the same as heterosexuality, with gayness, as Connell puts it, defined in opposition to that. We might recognise, for instance, the manner in which gayness is often conflated with effeminacy. We certainly see in this early exchange that for Danny and Carl, to be a man is also, by definition, to be heterosexual. And beyond the potential consequences that their burgeoning relationship might have for their friendship or Danny's marriage, I would argue that it is this perceived incompatibility of a same-sex relationship with Danny and Carl's identities as relatively masculine men that is the root of much of Striking Viper's dramatic conflict. Now, in many episodes of Black Mirror, the conflicts that are brought about by whatever technological innovation is the focus of that episode would, in the absence of that technology, likely have come about anyway. Without the various medical advances present in Rachel, Jack and Ashley 2, for example, Catherine would probably have found other means through which to control Ashley O's career and life. In Striking Vipers, however, I'm not sure that this is the case. For the ability to escape to a virtual world beyond the reaches of hegemonic masculinity is key to enabling Danny and Carl to explore their sexuality in the way that they do. In The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell foregrounds a moment in all narratives where the hero transfers his spiritual centre of gravity from within the pale of his society to a zone unknown. In some cases, this is a real, physical departure from one place to another. In others, it is metaphorical or psychological. What is important is that the protagonist is in some way removed from their comfort zone and placed in a new context, where the knowledge that they have built up over the course of their lives no longer applies. Usually, when analysing a film through this lens, we focus on the challenges that the devaluing of the protagonist's existing knowledge presents. In Striking Vipers, however, the devaluing of Danny and Carl's existing knowledge of gender and sexuality presents an opportunity. See, in my most recent episode of What the Theory, we looked at the work of Michel Foucault, who argued that the knowledge we are given about the world has significant ramifications for how we construct our identities. If, for instance, we are presented with the idea that gender and sexuality are binary as an objective fact, then in constructing our own personal gender and sexual identities, we will likely pick one or the other. We won't even know it's possible to question that. This very much seems to be the context in which Danny and Carl have constructed their personal flavours of masculinity. Nevertheless, when they place those glowing white pucks on their foreheads and leave behind the desaturated real world for the bright colours of the virtual one, new possibilities are opened up. Most obviously, Danny, who has been unable to work out since he injured his knee, regains his mobility in the body of Lance. Carl goes further, taking on the body of Roxette. And it follows that, in a virtual world of such limitless possibilities, something as restrictive as gender norms might hold little weight. 
Now, it might initially simply be a result of the distancing effect that comes with knowing that anything that happens within the world of striking vipers is to some degree less real than anything which happens in the real world, which enables Danny and Carl to experiment sexually in the way that they do. The excuse of it just being a game gives both characters plausible deniability. This is perhaps best exemplified by Danny's discomfort when Carl comes over for dinner. Again, some of this discomfort about discussing their in-game sexual liaisons at the dinner table is brought about by the fear that Theo might discover what they've been up to. But his anguish is exacerbated by the fact that to speak of their relationship face to face would be to accept that it is more than just roleplay. Nevertheless, more and more it is hegemonic masculinity's limited dominion in the virtual world of striking vipers which enables the game to become a space in which both characters can discuss and tentatively reconstruct their gender and sexual identities in a way that they never would have been able to do in the real world. It is interesting to note, however, that while their entrance into the virtual world may take away the need to constantly be affirming their masculinity, Danny and Carl's internalisation of gender and sexual binaries don't dissolve away instantaneously. Indeed, after their second in-game hookup, Carl proposes to Danny that he guesses that's us gay now. Within this, there is very clearly the presence of binary thinking. For Carl, to have slept with someone of the same sex means that they must now be 100% gay. It remains an either or choice. Danny's response, however, is that it don't feel like a gay thing. Now, we might read this as another attempt to deny the realness of what they've just done, another deployment of the excuse that it's just a game. Or maybe there's something far more genuine being expressed here. On one level, we might suggest that this is Danny coming to realise through his own experience that there is, in fact, no intrinsic contradiction between masculinity and sleeping with another man. Despite hegemonic masculinity's attempts to convince him that this is the case, he has slept with another man and yet has not suddenly been rendered any less manly himself. The pertinency of Danny's response, however, doesn't stop there. Because it's not only in the pejorative, non-masculine meaning that Connell suggested above is often applied to the phrase that Danny and Carl's having had sex might not make them gay. For having fallen for a man does not entirely devalue their previous, or in Danny's case current, relationships with women. The legal scholar Kenji Yoshino suggests that even when we talk about sexuality in an entirely positive and progressive light, there is the tendency to overlook or forget the very real existence of bi people, what Yoshino refers to as bisexual erasure. Perhaps they're bi then? Maybe? But trying to put a label on what sexual orientation Danny and Carl's relationship might be an example of is made even more complex when we take into account the fact that in all of their encounters, Carl is in a female body. How do we factor that in? Furthermore, when Danny and Carl meet up in real life, they both state that they don't feel the same spark that they do in the virtual world replicated in real life. Now, I don't entirely believe Danny here, but taking them on their word, how do we factor in the fact that the sex happening within the context of VR is an inseparable part of their desire? Maybe what all of this serves to show us is that the labels we attempt to place on sexual orientation and sexual identity are, like those we attempt to place on gender, not only highly restrictive, but also not even fit for purpose. Indeed, in the article I mentioned a moment ago, Yoshino argues that the view, powerful in modern American culture, that sexual orientation arrays itself along a continuum, from exclusive heterosexuality to exclusive homosexuality, misses out as much as it encompasses. What of asexuals, for instance? Or what of anyone whose sexuality simply doesn't fit into the various moulds we've created? 
maybe Danny and Carl's relationship isn't a gay thing, but also isn't a straight thing, but also isn't a bi thing, but instead, in truth, is just far too complicated to stick a label on. In Queer Theory and Introduction, Anna Marie Jago suggests that sexual identities, sexual orientations and gender identities are neither binary nor, in truth, categorisable at all, but instead are a constellation of multiple and unstable positions. This doesn't mean that the various labels that we have devised to position ourselves within that constellation are entirely useless. Indeed, they can often provide a useful language for seeking emancipation from patriarchal structures. But it does mean that we should do our best to recognise that they are always, to some extent, a psychological and social fiction. Striking Vipers, the episode, not the game, sees two men who, at the very opening, are very much trapped by binary thinking surrounding both gender and sexual identity, making this discovery for themselves. The VR technology which allows them to enter into the world of Striking Vipers, the game, not the episode, also allows them to leave behind all they thought they knew about their own identities, and places them into a space where a need to conform is replaced by an almost open-ended possibility. By extension then, Striking Vipers encourages us to consider what might be gained from unlearning that which we think we know about gender and sexuality, and to consider the increased possibilities for our own identities that might come from doing so. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it or found it interesting. As I said at the beginning, if you'd like a copy of the script for this video, then uh, you can head over to my Patreon and check that out. I would really appreciate you uh, considering supporting me on there. Uh, and a thumbs up uh, on the like thing down below is always very much appreciated. All that out of the way, however, uh, thank you very much for watching once again and have a great week.